Welcome to the Presbyterian Journey. I'm Reverend Lucas Levy Keppel, co-pastor of Trinity Presbyterian Church in Bixby, Oklahoma, a part of Eastern Oklahoma Presbytery and the Synod of the Sun in the Presbyterian Church USA. Over the next several weeks, we'll be following a story of the Presbyterian journey, where Presbyterians came from, who we are, and where we might be going. This video series will combine history, theology, worship, and storytelling, and is a great overview for anyone on their own Presbyterian journey. Whether you started walking at eight weeks or 80 years ago, like all long-distance journeys, though, we can't spend too long in any one place. If anything in this series piques your interest, I highly recommend chatting about it with your pastor. They'll surely be able to answer questions or direct you to a greater depth of resources about your questions. This week, we're heading back to the beginning of the church with creeds from Rome and Nicaea. Now, we will talk about various creeds and confessions in this series, but let's first start with a distinction between the two. A creed is intended to be used in worship. It is much shorter and usually tries to give an overview of theological doctrine. Despite what confession tends to mean to us today, a church confession is not an explanation of wrongdoing or a listing of various sin. Instead, confessions are statements of faith, usually much more in-depth than creeds, intended to dive deeply into theology. Both creeds and confessions are primarily reactions to the world, either to clear up biblical misunderstandings or an attempt to sum up a Bible message. And so we'll begin with the Apostles' Creed. This creed, which is used widely in the Western Church today, is an expansion of a second century baptismal creed from Rome. It's short enough to be used in worship as a statement of faith in its entirety, and it is often the model for personal statements of faith, both for its brevity and its succinctness. The Apostles' Creed stood as a response to three different heresies. First, the Marcion heresy was that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are different gods, and that Jesus is not the predicted Messiah of the Hebrews, but a completely separate new revelation of God's intent. Second, the Docetist heresy stated that Jesus only seemed to be human but really was God in disguise. Finally, the Donatist heresy was that anyone who rejected Jesus for any reason should never be allowed back into the church. Like many of the early creeds, the Apostles' Creed stands out for how much emphasis is put on Jesus Christ. While God receives a single sentence in the creed, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, Jesus receives an entire stanza. The Spirit is just lumped into a group of statements that stand strangely isolated, just statements of belief without much detail about what that means. The reason for this is that this was a baptismal covenant, and the adults who would be baptized into the church spent at least months, if not longer, studying the scriptures and understanding what each of these statements meant. It got its name from a legend that spread soon after its composition, that it was spoken by the twelve apostles on Pentecost, with each contributing at least one line to it. That's why in many older versions you'll find it divided into twelve different sections. However, it is divided, as many baptismal creeds were, into three parts. Father, Son, Spirit, following the biblical instruction to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll come back to the doctrine of the Trinity in a little bit. Next, let's head over to the city of Nicaea, located in Anatolia, just south of Byzantine Constantinople. 
Nicaea was the on-again, off-again capital of the Roman province of Bithynia and the seat of a bishopric in the early church. As an existing capital, it had ample room for large meetings. When the Roman Emperor Flavius Valerius Constinius, also called Constantine the Great, wanted to convene a church-wide council, Nicaea was the perfect place to do it. So the Council of Nicaea argued and debated and designed a creed to be used by the whole church. Its primary focus was on the heresy that stated that Christ was not co-equal and co-eternal with God, but was created by God, a heresy known as Arianism. The Nicene Creed was in constant use by both the Western and the Eastern churches, until a Latin translation added a single word. The Greek-speaking Orthodox East yelled that the Latin-speaking Catholic West couldn't unilaterally change the creed. This ended up being a part of the Great Schism that broke apart the two major churches. However, both still use the Nicene Creed, and it is the only creed used in both West and East, even with the single added word in the West. That added word had to do with some clarity around the Trinitarian identity. Originally, the creed stated that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, but the added Latin word clarifies that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. You see, the idea that God is three persons sharing one essence, which is the traditional definition of the Trinity, is one of the most complicated ideas of Christianity. As the Reverend Dr. Shirley Guthrie put it, we inevitably emphasize either one at the expense of three, or three at the expense of one. You may have seen this video, which becomes popular every year in March, where St. Patrick is interrogated over the doctrine of the Trinity. Every time he tries to explain the Trinity by analogy, the people asking him about it remind him of the different ways that particular analogy gets it wrong. Finally, he gets frustrated enough to exclaim, Fine, the Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. Well, why didn't you just say that, Patrick? Yeah. Or, as Shirley Guthrie summarized, the Trinity is a mystery to be confessed, not a mathematical problem to be solved. In that mystery, we have two main ways of understanding. First, the works of the persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are indivisible. It's not that God is creator, Christ is redeemer, and spirit is sustainer, but all are involved in every action of the Trinity. Second is the concept of perichoresis, that the Trinity is a divine community who live with and for and in one another in mutual openness, freedom, and self-giving love. In that modeling of community, is the hope that we humans will be able to do likewise, living with and for one another in openness, freedom, and self-giving love. We could spend hours discussing any one of these topics, of course, but that's plenty to think on for this week. Next week on our Presbyterian journey, we'll be heading to Wittenberg, where we'll have a chance to look at the Reformation, Luther, and the sacraments. I hope you'll join us again next week and remember to subscribe, if you haven't already, in order to receive notifications of when our next video will be released. Thank you very much, and have a great day.